Welcome to this People and Purpose interview. My name is Esther Moana Mills and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Laura Penhall, who is the team lead for the Coxless crew. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. We're really excited to be able to speak to you about this massive challenge that you and your team have recently undertaken. Um, you were, correct me if I'm wrong on any of these details, but you were the first female team to row the Pacific Ocean. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, we were the, the first ever all-female crew. And also, um, there's never been a, a force boat to have rowed across the ocean. So, but yeah, we, in essence, we were the first females, but also did it ahead of the boys too so that was a, a brucey bonus <laughs> fantastic so tell me a little bit about how your um how your project came about oh it's yeah long journey it it started would have been over four and a half years ago now and fundamentally i have been looking for some time i've been looking to do something that was going to very much take me out of my comfort zone to test me on a, a mental as well as a physical sort of challenge really and I was approached by a friend of mine who'd heard about a girl that was looking to put a together a team to row across the Indian Ocean at the time so I'd met up with her and got got involved in in that and that's my that was my first my first sort of taste I guess of of ocean rowing of hearing about it and seeing what it what it could be about and then that that basically that row evolved into we found out that there was already an all-female crew that had rowed the Indian and so I was more interested in seeing if anything had been untouched. And when I found out that the Pacific um, was a fairly untouched ocean, that sort of appealed to me even more. So it then evolved, the project evolved from being something that was only going to be a, a two months at sea project to suddenly a six months, six months sort of long winded project that became a lot, lot bigger than what we anticipated initially. So. Yeah, lots of lots of change. The um, unfortunately, who I had originally started the project with, um, she was un unfortunately able to continue. I mean, because the project had just got so much bigger than what was on the original outset. So, um, yeah, so that changed, and then we became the Cox crew, and then did a whole recruitment process, and basically, yeah, went from there to to set off last January, uh, April, sorry, April last year. Right. So you you rode eight and a half thousand miles altogether. Yeah. Just tell us a little bit about that journey. What was the actual? What was it like? <laughs> journey. What was it like? <laughs> um, yeah, it was. Wow. It's a, it a challenge in itself. I think getting to the start line was one journey. Um, mm -hmm. And that in itself, I'm still not 100 percent which was hardest. Um, I think they both, both had very different challenges, um, but it certainly helped me prepare for being out at sea and being yeah, faced with things that are very unpredictable, which is what we all face in a day to day basis, whether it's work life or home life in any situation. So getting to the start line was a challenge, but then out at sea, the, the journey itself, you know, we we prepared and planned as best that we could. So anything that did come unknown, we were, a, we were a bit more sort of, we had a process in place to hopefully deal with it well. Um, but when we left San Francisco on the 20th of April in 2015, within 24 hours, we were faced with quite a heavy storm off of the, the coast of America, so out of San Francisco. And so that kind of meant about three of us were fairly seasick. Um, I myself was very seasick for about 10 solid days. We were in big, big seas. Um, even the, the combination of the steep deprivation, the stress of getting to the start line. And yeah, the big seas, it was sort of, that was a bit of a rough ride for the first the first couple of weeks. And and we had to make some tough decisions and things. So yeah, it was, it was a bit of a rough start, to be honest. And then after about 10 days, the, the weather had settled and I started doing some checks on the boat and, and found there was water in, in the hatch with the, where the battery was. Wow, okay. But yeah, <laughs> not exactly what you like mixing with electricity is water. So yeah, it wasn't ideal. And we found that the, one of the charge controllers that charges up the batteries from the solar panels was had nearly set itself on fire. It was um, it had melted. So because it had been waterlogged and, and whatnot. So really tough decisions had to be made. It wasn't convenient at the time. We had to basically sit out at sea that night, put the power anchor out, get everybody out of the cabin because potentially it was a fire risk uh, because we were dealing with lithium batteries. So, yeah, I got the girls in the other cabin and then we did 
did two hours on, two hours off, but just sort of resting on the on the deck. And luckily, the the storm had calmed by that point until we could wait for daylight to assess the the damage and stuff. Um, by which point, long winded process, but. We then had to make decisions about do we continue? We're 500 miles offshore. Do we continue to go forwards or do we turn back? Um, and two of us wanted to continue forwards and two of the team wanted to turn back. And again, from a leadership perspective, that was that was really difficult because I wanted it to be, you know, us to be a decision making process of unanimous decisions. You know, everybody got an opinion. But when we were a split decision, it would come down to me. However, I was I was reluctant to jump into kind of pushing forwards when I had two of the team that were obviously weren't on that same same train of thought so we weighed up everything and I kind of explained the reasoning why I think we should continue forwards and the fact that we planned for this and we had backups we were already 500 miles offshore we were en route towards Hawaii so we should continue and it'll be tough to turn back into land um, and then when they come around and we decided collectively okay that's fine we'll continue I then rechecked the batteries as we started to move and unfortunately the other system had failed. So by which point I then thought, okay, you know what? No, you, this is a, you're right. We'll, we'll turn back into land and had to make that decision to then turn back, which was, I think one of the toughest decisions I had to make mm -hmm. um, out there because yeah, it, it felt like a bit of a failure at the time, but luckily we were able to turn it around as a positive. Yeah, and then you you ended up rowing the whole way anyway. So although, yeah, yes, although it was a very difficult start. Um, you then eventually got all the way um, to Australia. We did, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so, yeah, definitely. It was the sort of I think it 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 tested us in our teamwork. It tested us in our decision making, um, but at the same time, it it kind of brought us a lot of strength to sort of see that we had systems in place and that we trusted each other in what we were how we were moving forwards and we moved forwards as a team and that was collectively I think what brought us closer together as well so yeah worked out for the best in the end for sure fantastic well congratulations it's a, it's, yeah. it's a truly amazing achievement thank you, know, you. incredibly thank you well done <laughs> would you mind just introducing that your your team members and I understand that although it was a forced boat um, and therefore at any one time there were there were four of you actually at least in one of the places you had some rotation is that right we did, yeah. So the aim was, yeah, it was originally going to be a, a all-female crew of four. Um, but then a few months just before we set off, um, Isabel Burnham was unfortunately able to, she had a very difficult decision to make to support her family and things. So there, she had sort of, um, she had to make a very difficult decision. So she was able to commit to doing the first leg, but she needed to get back for family commitments basically after that. So it, it worked out for the best in the end because then we, <clears throat> excuse me, we then um, had the opportunity to go back to, because we'd done a big recruitment process initially, we still had some other girls that were interested in being part of the team and we'd met and the girls had met before. So uh, it, it gave us an opportunity to go back to the to the sort of the pool, so to speak, and and then pull in Lizanne who, Van Vuren, who lives in South Africa, um, she did the second legs. She joined us in Hawaii to Samoa. And then in Samoa, Meg Dios then joined us on the third leg. And the three of us that were consistent throughout from the start to finish was myself, Emma Mitchell and Natalia Cohen. And we we did it from America across to Australia. Yeah. And I met um, you and Natalia um, probably about 18 months ago at least now yeah. when you were you were talking about your preparations and you were talking about the reasons behind wanting to do this and then some of the charity work that you were doing on the back of on the back of your your rowing challenge so tell me a little bit about the, the charities and why you've chosen them yeah so the the two charities are breast cancer care and um, walking with the wounded we've set up a specific fund for women that have been injured at war and have come back to go on and achieve some amazing things that we want to support them on that journey so the reason behind that uh were two different kind of two different reasons but collectively they come together as two separate charities in the face that both of them support people um through kind of the adverse situations that they've had to overcome the life-changing situations and they they're charities that basically go on and support people with what their life journey looks like after they've been through that adversity. And and that, from my perspective as a physio, it, it really rings true to me. I, I like to see my athletes and, and patients I work with is um, 
I like to see them as a whole and to sort of see kind of where they progress from. And it's not just about the hands on treatment and treating what you see there and then, because when they walk out of the clinic, when they walk out of, of being rehabbed or walk out from, you know, having overcome breast cancer, it's been such a massive impact on their decision and what defines them and all of that sort of thing with their life that if you don't then have that support afterwards, it's the it's the basically the make or break or kind of that that crucial time when uh, when somebody can either make something of their life or or really sort of yeah be quite sort of traumatized by it. So that's what I love about these two charities is they support people through that pathway after as well as during um, and go on to sort of show them what they can achieve. And for me, fundamentally, that's something that <clears throat> I hold very true to my heart in that working with Paralympic sport, I, I really hugely believe in supporting people to to work to their abilities. And I suppose I'm surrounded by it every day with athletes that I work that inspire me personally. And that's what drove me to do the row is that, you know, I didn't know what my own abilities were mentally or physically. And so I basically kind of wanted to see that going forward. Um, in supporting others, in, in really sort of searching to find what your own abilities are, whether you're somebody that's been injured at war, whether you're somebody that's overcome breast cancer, or even on a day-to-day, -day, somebody that's kind of, you know, we all have our own challenges. So rowing in the Pacific for us was was collectively to support our charities, but to show people as well, we've all got our own Pacific to cross, however big or small. Wonderful, thank you. So, Laura, having been through this now, what would you say are some of your key learnings, some of the ones that that um, could be translated into other walks of life or into other aspects of leadership? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge amount to take out from it. I, I think on a yeah, personal and leadership and teamwork sort of level, for a few key points, I guess, are, you know, communication is, is key. Having, I mean, we, as a, as a collective, the, the girls, I suppose, to sort of put it in perspective, that each of the girls involved in the team have come in at different stages. So relating that to business, when you are a leader in a, in a business perspective and you've got a vision, you've got a drive, you, you know kind of what you want to achieve in the future and you've got you're on a plan um, and you basically want to get people to come on board with that plan. What I was finding when I was trying to get recruitment of, of team members was you know, how can I get them on board with that? Or how can I allow them to have some autonomy within the realms of us all working towards the same direction? It's that classic sort of, you know, image of where you see everybody so enthusiastic and passionate about stuff, but we're all working in different directions. So things get a bit skewed. So how can our arrows basically be facing in the same way? So what I had to do with that is allow myself to to kind of step back a little bit of the control, which is hard hard for me in those first stages. I think, you know, I hadn't realised how much I, yeah, you just, I have a vision and I have a drive and I, I get very passionate and extremely stubborn about it to achieve it. So the girls very much, the, the personalities and the diversity of our team was really useful for me to kind of give myself some reflection back on like, actually, you know what? I can't control everything. I can't have all the font of knowledge of, about everything with the row. The girls need to understand certain stuff, you know, in different roles. So it was about giving them roles. It was about giving them autonomy, finding out what they wanted to get out of the row so that they had the interest that was going to be sustainable throughout all of the ups and downs and to know what they kind of, when the difficult times they were faced with, they could draw, you know, I could help get them to draw on what their passions were and what they were trying to get out of this and I think that definitely carries through to business in the sense of you'll have different people coming in different people leaving jobs and coming back into you know new roles and you need to support that change that transition but get them up to speed and get them on board with what your vision and your your pathway is but in order to do that you need to also understand what it is they want to do what's their personal development plan what what is it that they want to do in the future so that they can get the most out of how they're working with you but at the same time you're helping them to develop so that it's a win-win situation for both parties I guess yeah and so on sorry yeah. on, the, on the bringing bringing people into the team point can I specifically ask you about the the 
the sort of crew changes mid row yeah. because presumably by then by the time you're arriving from San Francisco to Hawaii you are a, a very well oiled machine you're very very close both physically and presumably mentally and emotionally yeah. how do the man- you manage the process of 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 losing a part of that team and also then then bringing someone along and making sure that they feel part of your team as you then row on and then the same thing in in Samoa so was was there anything in particular that either you or the team as a whole did to kind of manage that process yes 100% yeah it was we always knew that was going to be a vulnerable point for us um both for the dynamic of the three that were continuing with the whole row with Mm -hmm. the new person that's coming in we so again it was something we planned for we prepared yeah we had a great sports psychologist that without a doubt our our teamwork, our transition, getting the girls up to speed, getting us all familiar with our personalities, what makes us tick, what what fires us, what makes, yeah, all of those sort of factors were facilitated by a psychologist that has a background in occupational psychology. So working in business and stuff and seeing what works in management and where developments need to be. But at the same time, he's also got a sports psychology background as well. So he was able to bring in a lot of skill sets which supported us in that process. And so even before getting on the water, we knew that that was going to be a vulnerable point. So our plans in place were the fact that, you know, we kept the the girls that were coming in in leg two and leg three, we kept communication with them whilst we were out at sea. They had active roles in what they were doing on the ground. So they still felt part of the row and knew that they were team members. Um, when we then got into land we'd sort of just prior to that we'd started to set up how we would roll out you know Izzy basically how we'd support her coming out of the team and also then when we got to land how we'd facilitate getting Lizanne in and what that kind of looked like was it, to be honest if uh, you know the first time we did it with Izzy and Lizanne it it wasn't necess- it wasn't that slick you know it could have been a lot better and it's it was kind of we were able to have the opportunity to learn from that to make it better for when Lizanne then stepped out and Meg came in and the reason for that is because we were just it ended up being so busy in Hawaii and we got so caught up in well I suppose I got so caught up in loads of stuff we had to manage with the boat and other things so as ever you've always got distractions and you've always got like other things but fundamentally we'd set it aside that that was a real priority and typically instead of having a meeting uh, I wanted Izzy and Lizanne to have some time to themselves one-to-one so they Izzy could get Lizanne up to speed from her point of view of how the other three of us work so she had some private time to share her true thoughts and then the aim was as well then we sat down as a team and we did a very open reflections which Lizanne was then part of that so she could see we get we went around the sort of group and we're like okay you know what this is what I think worked really well on this last leg you did this this and this however what I'd like to see less of is a bit of this this and this type thing so we gave very true open honest feedback which was a bit raw but it was good for Lizanne to see that and then from that we then said you know how can what roles could Lizanne do on the boat and then she could sort of see what she wanted to bring to the team Um, and we'd set that up as well prior to her coming out to Hawaii to sort of see what she wanted to contribute what were the sort of things whether it's like bringing quotes and stuff new quotes and images that she could help to motivate us whilst we're out there Um, and with that so the reason it went okay but it just could have been much better and it was much better with Meg is that we'd set that and we were going to do that and we did it but we ended up doing the meeting with Izzy just before she left so it was kind of about four days into having arrived in Hawaii and ideally then what we reflected on that and good reflection from Lizanne was that she wished she had that conversation at the very start so obviously we then changed that and did that when we when we got into Samoa with Meg and made that a priority over everything else with the boat stuff. So it was a good sort of process to be able to reflect and learn from what worked and what didn't, basically. Nice. And you talked about about um, motivation. And of course, this is this was a process that started on land. But then even at sea, you were at sea for 200 and something days. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So how do you keep motivation up? How do you kind of encourage perseverance and 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 frankly, just not um, not give up in the face of 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 challenges? Yeah, I mean, again, that was it was hugely strength to the team. It was the personalities that we had on the boat that the bonus of being actually a, a fours team over like a solo boat 
one of the strengths is that hopefully and this is what we did find is you're never all down in the dumps so even when things get really right. difficult you kind of always have at least one or two of you that are sitting a little bit more on the able to sort of see a bit more of the positive so I think fundamentally as well we agreed as a team that we would always try and pull the positives out of anything and um, a nice thing I mean Nat was great at, at sort of she was a great personality in that respect to I remember she would ask us sometimes when things were difficult, she'd be like, okay, you know what, just tell me three things that are brilliant about today. What what would you say are positives about today? I don't want to hear the negatives. I just want to hear, you know, the positives. And sometimes it can be the smallest of things. It can be eating a chocolate pudding <laughs> when <laughs> you're being thrown around in the waves and stuff. But the smallest of things, or putting on like a dry pair of socks that you've saved and it's been, you know, really soaking soaking wet and you've been soggy and putting on wet clothes to get back out in the oars and things so having saved a pair of dry socks suddenly becomes like the absolute haven of um of yeah of where you get some joy from so it was just interesting that everybody bought something different at different phases and different times throughout that throughout the row and I think that's where having a diverse team respecting the fact that you know not everybody sort of having the same type of personality I mean when I was trying to pull the team together again I was very naive when I started and I I suppose I was naturally thinking I'd want people that is similar mindset people that had been in professional sport or at least themselves competed at a very good standard so that people understood the the kind of methodology around kind of you know digging deep and all of that from a individual level but actually the team that we had we had a couple of people that had that mentality but we had you know we had two or three that didn't and they but what they bought is you know they've traveled they're worldly wise they've kind of got years and years of experience of other different types of teams and and they just see life in the world in a very different perspective and as much as you might think that that would bring a crash it didn't it just brought a, a new vibrant way of seeing things and really helps sort of keep you in the moment rather than think too far in the future and and stuff so it sounds like the, the diversity of your personalities and your experience actually enhanced what you were able to do rather than detract from it 100. rather than create conflict in the team yeah but I think because we also we recognize and we went over and over again about we knew how diverse we were we knew we were different personalities and everybody in our team I suppose had a very strong uh, opinion about you know we were adaptable and we were open to thinking you know what this person thinks very differently to me so I've got to remember if I'm getting frustrated about something it's actually most probably I need to put it in a very different way rather than you know offsetting your frustration onto that person because you don't think they get it or they're not seeing what you see it's because yeah their side of the their vision is is you know a completely different way they see a picture to the way you would so it, it definitely made you or made me think about how you can be very very lateral or think of things and see things from a different angle rather than imagining people still see it in your eyes interesting and I think that's that's something that that certainly applies to leaders and managers elsewhere but yeah. But your experience through the row and through the four of you being in Doris the Boat um, must have been a very intense version of what people experience in their office or in their project team or or, or whatever. Is there anything else that um, that you would highlight as your key learning from this process? Yeah, I mean, I guess for us, one of our strongest things as well, when I was saying about getting everybody to work in the same line and, and sort of be on board with things is we... You know, I had a vision of of how things were going to go, but to get the girls on board, we then collectively revisited what our values would be about and and basically changed those so that they were suitable for us as a team and everybody bought into those and everybody felt ownership over what our values were. So for us, it ended up being spirit. And spirit, we put on our boat, we, we embodied it, we would... If we were lying back in the cabin, we had our values right in front of us. So mm -hmm. we were constantly reminded about it. We constantly reviewed each other on a weekly basis to say, you know, how are we sitting with our values? You know what? I think you're showing great. And sorry, spirit to us meant strength, perseverance, integrity, resilience, inspiration and trust. So it was an acronym for kind of bringing our, our values alive. And um, and so we would also 
pull each other up on whether we weren't sitting with our values. So if if somebody wasn't being open about something, you could tell that they were holding something back. Then you'd say, you know what, integrity this week, you, you're kind of sitting a bit lower on, and you know th- this is an opportunity now to sort of see if you can be open. Like let's let's live live our values, and so also having an, a platform and opportunity to be able to reflect with each other on a weekly basis gave us a a comfortable place to be able to share anything that might have been uncomfortable so sometimes I think in the workplace as a leader or as a manager or something you you'll say you know you can I've got open door policy you can come to me at any time but some people some personalities they don't have that that awareness or they don't have that confidence to be able to make a decision to come and to you so having those review meetings having those opportunities where right once they're in the room they can then sort of say something to you but they might not make the appointment in the first place I think is something I've certainly carried forwards as well with people that I work with um, and just that openness and honesty I think is a key thing to take forwards as well not being scared of confrontation um, seeing things as well so confrontation is a key thing that obviously I see and work with people that I have to work with people will really shy away from it but then you know you'll get the emails that will be very confrontational so methods of communication sort of breaking down the barriers and and kind of being open to different viewpoints and different opinions and being adaptable to your own thoughts to that is is I think a key thing and and fundamentally for me the whole process has taught me to challenge my own thoughts and you know people don't see it in the same same way as you do so just keep yourself open-minded I guess Excellent. That's really useful ad- advice, uh, certainly across the board. Mm. One more thing I wanted to ask you about this is there was obviously a lot uh, about this row that was about the fact that this was four women in a boat at any one time, obviously a much bigger team than that. And I know that in terms of your, your support and your preparation, there were plenty of men involved. This wasn't a, oh. um, a, a sort of a women only project, no. but it was certainly a women only row and, 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 um, and you know, as we were discussing, you were the first female team to row the Pacific and in fact got there in the fours before before any men did. Do you feel that there are any particular differences in terms of how you will work together that came from the fact that you were all women? Um, no, you know what? I think men and, we, you know, we, we have an emphasis on on the female and all of that stuff. And I, I appreciate that kind of that's the angle that we've come from. But to a certain extent, I don't. You know, we talk about feminism and that sort of thing. I I just think everybody's on a spectrum, you know, men, male and female. You, we're all on a kind of a spectrum of whether that's confidence levels, whether that's, um, yeah, sort of how we put ourselves forwards and and empathy and all of those things. You know, you can have a, you can have a male that's very empathetic. You can have a female that's that's not so, but very confident in what they what they go forwards with. So. I think we're all on a spectrum. What I do like to see is is just getting that equality. So when I say, okay, we were the female boat over and ahead of the boys, which is just sort of a bit of fun, it it's because there's so much out there of expeditions that it's always the it's always males that have gone on yeah. to achieve things. So it's just nice to sort of start getting a little bit of equality. Not necessarily women are better than men or men are better than women. It's it's just seeing a bit of equality across the board. Um, is what I love to see and women in sport and all of those sorts of things is just to get the recognition that's deserved. Um, but from a point of view of qualities, I guess, yeah, I, I know having talked to others about male teams that have gone forwards is, you know, there potentially could be clashes of, of leadership because they're, everybody wants their ownership on, on leading stuff. You know, we, we certainly sort of had to go through some of those challenges because the girls and themselves are all, have all led different things in the past. So, mm. But I guess, you know, we did have a very, the girls are empathetic. We're all very kind and caring towards each other. Um, But that's not to say guys aren't either, you know. So potentially that's maybe what we brought to the the crew in that sense. But um, it doesn't mean to say, I don't know, male teams that that don't have that same same sort of confidence and the same kind of kind, caring, looking out for each other ability that, that we did. Thank you very much.